Welcome to the ninth episode. We made it to nine, guys. We did it. The ninth episode of the Untitled Mike Ashmore podcast. My name is, of course, Flash Weird Graphic here. Mike Ashmore. You can follow me on all social media channels at Mashmore98. Rob Crowell is our guest. Uh, covered Rob in 2016, the last year of his career, after a five-year stay in the Padres organization that we, we get into in depth uh, in this episode. Um talk about his his year with Somerset uh and also we kind of started out with his uh his role in, in the paper supply business as well he took over uh, didn't take over but is, is now working for the the family business in uh, a time where uh masks and paper supplies and janitorial supplies are uh really uh in need right now so Rob's doing a good thing right now uh Rob was also at my wedding got married to that beautiful lady right there I'll flash a, a photo here as well of uh, of Rob at my wedding and uh, his his lovely girlfriend Jacqueline as well. Um, there they are. See, ignore my big shiny head. There they are. So uh, yes, without further ado, uh, our chat on the Untitled Mike Ashmore podcast with Rob Crow. All right, guys, and welcome back to the Untitled Mike Ashmore podcast, episode number nine. When you guys think of Somerset Patriots who wear number nine, I'm sure. The first guy you think of is our next guest, <laughs> Rob Crowell, is on the Untitled Mike Ashmore podcast. Rob, my good friend, buddy, how are you doing? Doing well, man. It's good to hear your voice. Yeah, it's been a while, huh? It has been, has been, since uh, you kicked my ass in NHL. <laughs> yes, yes, it's a, uh, a proud moment. I know I did not put on a, a good showing uh, video game-wise at my wedding, which you were you're kind enough to, to show up at, but uh, yes. other than that, uh, I feel like I've done pretty well uh, video game-wise uh, in your presence. So Absolutely. You had a lot of other things going on that day, just a couple, so yeah, uh, I'll, I'll let it slide. Yes. So, uh, like I said, Rob is at my wedding. I've known uh, Rob uh, ever since he signed with with Somerset, and Rob's been a, a really great friend ever since. And I know you've been um, exceptionally busy as of late, uh, kind of in the paper supply business, kind of a family owned thing that you have going on here that you've had for generations now, really. Um, but you've only been a, a big part of it recently, I guess. What has it been like, I guess, with everything that, that's going on? Um, you know, handling a lot of that. What has that been like for you to have that on your plate? So it's been, it's been quite a transition. Um, you know, the year was started off really well and, you know, you heard rumblings of, of the, the virus overseas and stuff. And, you know, probably that third week of March going, going into the fourth week, we saw a decline in business about 50%. Well, that would be the start of the lockdown. And it was very scary to see the trucks, you know, when they were going out that week. And we actually, we sat down on my birthday, and uh, before we got any, into any celebrations that weekend, we were like, we need to run numbers and just see what we're going to do. The The goal throughout this entire process is keep everyone staffed, keep everyone on board, being able to pay all the employees, and keep the business afloat. Um, and basically, what you know, since then, I would probably say the last week of March was, was tough, and then the first week of April, not as great, but... Over those two weeks, we really learned how to transition our business into more based off of what is going on right now. Because, you know, we're pretty much a 60-40 food service to janitorial, and now we are probably an 80 to 20 janitorial to food service. And um, we're trying to just um, – we transition ourselves into the market and what, the, what everyone needs right now, which is disinfectants, sanitizers – um, antibacterial hand soaps, uh, paper products, all that sort of things. Um, protective wear like face masks or, or coveralls. Um, so we're, we're doing good. It's been crazy busy, obviously, because of those things. Not only do businesses that are open need them, but the general public does. Yeah. So the volume of calls has been extreme, which is, which is great because obviously for a while we were wondering if we were going to be able to stay open, but now it's been – we're, we're, we're good. We're even keel, which is great. You know, that's all we want to do in this whole thing is weather the storm, you know? Yeah. Um, so we've transitioned, but, and, and, you know, people, uh, 
you know, it's good getting people what they need that way. Um, no question about it. And we just had to, you know, like I said, transition what our focus was on what we were going to sell. And uh, fortunately for, you know, the first uh, month of this lockdown, it's, it's worked out. So I'm going to try to get some masks from Rob once our phone call is over. And that is literally Please. no joke. I, I will try to do that. Um, I guess where you can, absolutely can. Where can people find uh, more about you guys? Allen Paper Supply. So we have a website. Really general. I think it's www.allenpapersupply.com. Um, I just actually uh, created an Instagram account. I believe we have a Facebook account too. And um, we're, we're starting to get the social media thing going a bit because, you know, uh, selling to the general public as opposed to just other small businesses has been key to us staying open and just key for people to get the different products they need that way. Um so those are three options, and then uh, they have all the information. We are in Randolph uh, over by the DMV and uh, Aspen Ice in that complex over there. Um, every day, 9 o'clock to 5 o'clock, if you want to go give us a call, and we'd be able to help you out with whatever we possibly could. But, um, yeah, those are the three social media things. We're trying to grow that a bit, and um, that's pretty much it. So uh, was this always kind of the plan for you once the, the playing career was over? Because this is a family business, like I said. Was it always kind of the route that you thought you were going to take once the, the playing days were done? It was, yeah, I, th- I think it was. It, it, it was always the easiest transition um, because it's what I would do when I was home every off season, uh, from helping out with, you know, in the warehouse or, you know, doing some sales stuff or driving the truck. So it was very seamless. Um, I would have been open to if there were other options out there um, to, to pursue, but it really is nice being able to work with the family. Um, yeah. There's some, there's some tough times obviously that go along with that, but uh, it, it, it was probably option number one. And, and a really cool thing also is, you know, mom and dad, with all the things they did for us over the years with driving us to all the baseball, hockey, soccer games, you know, spending countless amounts of money. It's nice to be able to then be there to kind of, you know, take some stress off of them, which is a, a small and probably very, you know, seamless uh, give back. But it, it's something at least, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So. Transition back to sports here a little bit, I guess. Um, I do kind of want to, you know, start at the beginning. And I guess for me, with you, that's kind of your time at Randolph High. Um, st- stud in baseball, stud in hockey. I guess my first question w- would be, um, was there ever a thought to pursuing hockey? Because you were pretty good at that. Um, there, uh, At times. I bet if you asked me during the middle of hockey season, I would have said something like that. But as I got older... Um, at the end of the high school career, I started to realize that baseball was probably the best way to move forward to a higher, higher level, you know, as opposed to just playing maybe club hockey or something at a college, I was starting to see that maybe I had the possibilities of, you know, really taking baseball to another level. And that's ultimately what made me want to try and pursue that over hockey. Gotcha. The College of Charleston. How does one end up uh, there from Randolph, New Jersey? Honestly, I wanted to get out of the Northeast to play baseball. I, I had to get out of the cold. I, I really had my uh, my sights set on going south from the very beginning. And um, it was kind of looking not so good for a while. I, um, I had an offer pulled from me by Coastal Carolina, actually. So that was going to be like the number, the first choice when going south. And then that got pulled. And then I didn't, you know, I, I went to a camp at Charleston. We ended up uh, getting a hold of this guy who kind of just had connections all over the southeast uh, with with universities and stuff. And got me going to this camp at Charleston, did well. I think they gave me an, a scholarship offer like a couple days later and did a little visit down there. Beautiful city, beautiful campus, and uh, they had just gone to like the Super Regionals the year before, so I'm like, oh, these guys are good. Honestly, I'd never heard of them before, before that. And then, uh, honestly, the city really drew me in. It was, uh, it's beautiful. Got to be one of the best cities in America, so uh, from that point, I was sold. I guess it was part of wanting to go to that area. I saw that your your dad kind of pitched somewhat in that area back in, back in his his playing days as well. Was was there some um, reasoning there as well, or is that totally separate? You know, mom and dad both went to school in in North Carolina, so there was definitely a little bit of you know just 
they both loved going to school down south in the Carolinas and obviously uh, it fit well for baseball and it, it yeah you could say there was some not they didn't push me in that direction but it was kind of just it felt normal like oh yeah mom and dad did this okay all right well that certainly works um I guess, what was the experience like down there? Obviously, like you said, it's a beautiful place. Charleston is amazing. Uh, there's quite a bit to, to look at down in Charleston, and I guess we'll, we'll leave sure. it at that. But um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I know where you're going with that right there. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, I, I hope our, our listeners will, will figure that out as well. But um, I guess, what uh, what was the experience like there, just uh, being a college ball player down there? Uh, it was. It, it started off a little rough. We, um, we stayed away. Uh, from downtown like uh, the freshmen all got set up in apartments over by the field which is over the bridge actually in Mount Pleasant so the first year there was definitely some homesickness Uh, I got redshirted didn't really play at all and then as I got to know all the guys on the team and you know moved downtown got to know know more people absolutely unbelievable experience Um, you know there it really wasn't they're, they're not too much of a sports college so there really wasn't like um big you know uh you know benefits i guess if you're you know a, a, an athlete in class you know with professors and everything um but you know it was just anything i could have asked for it, the, the whole experience was just top notch it really was yeah was was there a point in your your time there where you kind of felt like that you know you were starting to put yourself on the map in terms of getting looked at by by teams for the draft um i would say definitely my my junior year or uh redshirt sophomore year and i kind of had a feeling that it was going to go that way after the summer beforehand um i didn't play that spring I only got nine at bats and then uh, my coach got me on a team in the Valley League and I ended up doing really well there, went to the All-Star game and stuff and then uh, happened to randomly out of nowhere, one of our last games of the season, this guy I've never seen before in my entire life comes up to me and he goes, you uh, you uh, want to go play in the Cape when the, the this league's done? I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so he gets me a uh, a, a contact at Wareham. I guess they needed a catcher. Their guy had just gone down. I the, uh, the Valley League ends. I drive up to New Jersey, say hi to my family, drive to the Cape the next day, end up doing really well. And then I guess just that confidence build up. It kind of just you know playing with all those guys, doing really well, knowing that I could play at that level, and then it all kind of just started to snowball, you know, and, and and with all positive things and. From there, you know, then when you when you see yourself being successful, you realize that, you know, hey, this this isn't a joke anymore. We you know, there's an opportunity here. Yeah. Um, had some guys on and it's kind of a broad question. But I've had some guys on who've talked about going to the Cape and what a big, important experience that was for, for their career. And I don't think a lot of people who are going to check this out really understand what a big prospect. I don't want to say showcase, but, you know, big uh you know, league it can be for, for prospects to get seen and kind of, you know, wood bats and all that kind of stuff. Uh, what did that really do for you to get that experience? Do you think? It was unreal. It was awesome. And, uh, I remember going there and, you know, you, it's every single team is just guys that you you read about on like all the big college baseball websites that all the big name guys who are coming out of high school, they're all going to go top whatever picks and it's just like, you know, you realize like you're in it now like this. You want to you want to see if you're good, you know, do well here or be, you know, uh, in the middle of the road here. And, it you know, the, the scouts, they they look at the, the Cape as just like that's they, they live and die by that thing. Like a guy could be decent, you know, little year in, uh, in college, go up to the Cape, kill it for a month and a half. Boom, you're golden. You know, you're you're going to go top few rounds next year even if you only have a mediocre season because they're like oh well you just killed it at the cape and that means more to us than you know the college season almost yeah uh, it's 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 just it's a really cool experience it was when first going up there just before the playoffs it was like almost like a little bit of like a mystique you know it was just like man like we're here and i i visited there before um when i was younger I remember uh, my one of my best friends growing up. His dad grew up with Schiffner, who was the coach, who was the coach of the A's at the time, the Chatham A's. And we stayed at his house. This is back when they had. I remember 
they had Longoria, they had Andrew Miller, they had a couple other guys that made it to the big leagues like significantly. And you just watch these guys, and you, then, then you see them in the big leagues a few years later, and then you realize you're playing on the same field as them, and it was just it's just really cool experience. Yeah. So 2010, like you said, things really kind of came together for you. I actually didn't know this. I'm surprised I didn't know this. I'm, I'm mad at myself for not knowing this. You got drafted by the Reds before you got drafted by the Padres. Was there any was there any thought to to signing there? Was that them not offering enough money to get you to leave college? I guess what was that whole situation? There was a couple of factors actually. Um, I had shoulder surgery after that season. Labrum surgery, yes. Yeah. Labrum surgery. So um, the whole season, uh, probably about the third weekend in, started to go. And then I finally started catching again probably about a month after that. They just told me, you know, you have really bad bicep tendonitis. You know, it's not that we, it'll go away. Never went away. And um, that was a problem. And they had drafted a catcher in the first round. And I was the second catcher they drafted. And the catcher they drafted in the first round um, was also a college guy. So I'm like, well, that's just, you know, a double stack against you now. You're going into, you'd, you'd sign, go into the, the Reds organization as a guy who can't throw yet. And you're still, and you're behind their first round guy forever, you know? Yeah. Um, that was Yasmani Grandal. Yeah, that's and, pretty good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's, he's worked out all right. And, uh. <laughs> So I'm like, you know, that's and I told the scout, I think like a week before the, the deadline, I'm like, I'm going to need this amount of money because if you're going to just sign me for me to go, you know, ride the bench, you know, until Grandal goes to the big leagues and then maybe get an opportunity if it all works out. Like, I'd like to at least get a monetary, you know, uh, you know, a value for that, you know, yeah. Some, something worthwhile. Um, actually, funny story. Next year, I get drafted by the Padres. And uh, they drafted a couple high school guys, like in the first couple rounds, and then me as the college guy. So I'm like, oh, perfect! Like I should be able to go in and you know start right away, you know, because I should be ahead of these guys. I'm driving home from Charleston, and my girlfriend at the time is sitting in the passenger seat. She goes, "Oh, the Padres! They just they just traded for a catcher." And it's Yasmani Grandal. I'm like, the same guy from the year before? Are you kidding me? Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That was that was too funny. Yeah. So you get drafted in 2010. Um, it kind of puts you maybe uh, on the, the big league map going forward. What is the, the pressure like in, in that next college season? Does that is, – is it trying to improve your draft stock? Is it just focusing on having a good year and let's see what happens? I guess what is kind of the mindset there? Yeah, I, I think for me, honestly, it was about uh, showing that I was healthy, to be honest, uh, coming off that surgery. Um, you definitely, you, there's definitely pressure uh, to improve draft stock, um, you know, have a great season. I, I definitely had a lot of confidence going into the next year, um, but there was a lot of uncertainty with my arm and how that was going to um, come through, if it was going to be healthy, if I was going to be able to showcase that at all, or if I was just going to have to go off of, you know, to, you know what they had possibly seen before I gotten hurt the year before, um, but yeah, there's definitely pressure. And you know, baseball is a funny game like that. When you get in your head too much and a couple of things don't go your way on the field, it can snowball really quickly. And uh, you know, that's actually one of the the biggest things in the game is not letting that happen. But yeah, there there was definitely pressure. But um, you know, and college actually at the same time, you know, you're playing so hard just to to win you know, with your buddies that, uh, that it keeps you a little bit grounded as opposed to just looking at yourself and, you know, what you're doing for the draft and things like that. Yeah. So you end up getting drafted, like you said, by the Padres, um, everybody's how they found out story is different. So what was yours? Um, my one the year before is better with the Reds, <laughs> but I actually did watch like the whole thing. I had it on my computer, just hanging out at, um, at my apartment in college that year with the Padres. The one the year before is way better. I was on the beach. Um, we had just gotten done. We just gotten knocked out of the regionals by Coastal in the final. And it was literally the next day was day two of the draft. So we were out on the beach drinking, having a good time. And uh, I go check my phone because a couple of the scouts has which still been texting me. And then I had a text from my buddy. Um, he goes, hey, man, you just got drafted. I'm like, oh, well, what do you know? That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, I don't know, like 10 minutes later, the scout called me to let me know. But honestly, 
we had just got we had just lost the heartbreaker in the finals and we were just out on the beach having a good time i had a feeling it was going to happen i didn't know when on that second day yeah. but yeah my buddy told me so that was that was probably the better story the, the second time i was actually watching it very intently to see what was going on yes so drafted by the padres head of the minors um did you go to the arizona league first is that right I did. I spent the whole first summer there. Okay, so um, that's got to be a bit of a transition because, I mean, I've I've seen some games there. I might have been the only person in the stands for some games in that league. Um, (laughs) Yeah, what what is that like kind of because I think the, you know, the the vision of getting to pro ball, you're playing in front of all these people, it's great, and then you go there and it's it's maybe not all that, I guess. What was your experience like kind of making that transition right away? No, you hit hit the nail on the head there. it's, It's night and day, you know. Like you said, you being in the stands would be a packed crowd for <laughs> for the Arizona League, um, and you know it's 110 degrees out. You just got done, you know, doing your, you know, they, it's pretty much like a spring training, and then you just play a game afterwards. Uh, but you go through the whole day, pretty much the exact same thing, and you know you're playing with guys who, you know. Some of them are 16 years old, 17 years old. If they're from, you know, Australia or the Dominican or Puerto Rico or wherever in uh, Central or South America, um, you know, you got some guys in college, some uh, high school guys. It's just, uh, you know, other guys are rehabbing. It's just a complete mishmash of guys playing ball. And um, there's really no focus on winning. It's just about development. And as a college guy, you know, you're coming from – playing in, you know, big games in college, you know, some games are pretty packed, but they were all intense. And then these games are just kind of like, you're looking around like, where the hell am I? What the hell am I doing? This is not what I thought was going to happen. Um, I heard short season. I never played short season, but I heard that was a lot better. Um, depending on what league you were in, but man, it was like, it was tough. Sometimes it, it, it got you a bit mentally for sure. Yeah, the back of your baseball card after that is pretty fascinating, at least to me. I don't know how it is to you, but um, just just that next year. It's one way to describe it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that next year, um, you know, I was in affiliated ball for a while, covered affiliated ball for a while, and there was always those handful of catchers who would kind of shuttle up and down between levels and kind of more like a, an org guy kind of thing. And that's kind of how the back of your card reads for that, that first full year. And I know that's not really you know, what you were to them, your 10th round pick. So what was that, that 2012 season like? You're shuttling between high A, double A, triple A, never go to low A, never go to short season. Um, what is that like um, having to go through all that? It was extremely confusing. Um, and I, I, I started to see the forest of the trees as I, you know, was around it more. But like you said, I thought, you know, they would just put me right there in low way to start the season. I'm like, you know, but they didn't, they kept me in extended. And I believe they put a guy who got drafted like 10 to 15 rounds after me in low way with their top round uh, pick hedges, who is now their, their starting catcher in the big leagues and the low way slot. And I'm like, if anything, I thought I would have just gone there because like, don't I have some sort of like, you know, lead on that guy who they drafted after me. Yeah, but it wasn't. They kept me an extended. To say I'm, I, I was frustrated was an understatement. And then you know, I started. I went up one time to high A. I did good. It didn't matter. They shipped me right back down to extended again. And then as extended was breaking, just beforehand they shipped me off to double A, then triple A, then back to high A. And I'm just like. I was like, I'm pretty much just like a piece of meat to these guys, I guess. Um, but I had some really good advice along the way from a lot of the different managers. It's like, look, man, you can't control where they're going to send you. Just control what you can do on the field. And fortunately, actually, I think when you put the numbers together, even with the limited at-bats, it was a pretty successful year, personally. Um, so I kind of learned real quick just to just to start grinding, take it day by day, wherever they put you, they put you, whenever you play, you play, but always be ready. But to say it was confusing and a whirlwind, uh, a lot of emotions at times, a lot of venting sessions to my parents and friends. And uh, yeah, it was, it was weird for a while. There's no doubt about that. But I think I also gained a lot of confidence because you're seeing all the top levels of baseball that year. And I think when I had a little bit of success playing against them, I'm like, I I can do this. Just give me another shot, you know? 
Yeah. Um, extended spring training, for those people who, who don't know who are listening to this, is basically a bunch of guys at the complex who either they don't know what to do with or guys who are rehabbing from injury and all, all that kind of stuff. Um, kind of between, exactly. yeah, between going to, to those levels, um, what is that, like, what are you doing at the, at, at the complex? Are you, are you sim games? Are you just working out? Is there downtime? Like, what is that experience like between trips to Tucson and San Antonio and Lake Elsinore? Um, yeah, you pretty much, you hit it right there. I mean, it, it is, it's just spring training. You're and spring training gets really boring by the end. You're ready to go, ready to do it. And then all of a sudden you, you get told, well, you got another month and a half of this. <laughs> and, you know, and then you go into the games in like Elson or San Antonio or Tucson, you know, high intensity games, all places there had great crowds, great fans. And, uh, then all of a sudden, yeah, you go back and you're like, are you freaking kidding me right now, man? Like, yeah. this just sucks. There's no other way to put it. I mean, and I, you know, I'm, as you know, from covering the Patriots, I, I can be a guy who wears my emotions on my sleeve a little bit at times. A little bit? I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I had a couple of, um, actually, the guy in Lake Elsinore, he told me when I got back the second time, he goes, you really need to figure it out down there because I had to beg to get you back because they said they didn't want to send you because you were being such an a-hole down there mm-hmm. after you got sent back. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, I get it. I'll, see. I'll, I'll, I'll get better. Yeah. Um, that 2013 season, then, I mean, that was, that's a hell of a year for you, arguably your best in pro by inarguably really, if we're, if we're being honest here, um, did that, did, sure. that, did that kind of feel like a, a make or break year for you? Yeah, you know, I, I went into that year kind of with a lot of confidence, like I said, from the year before, because I played all those levels. By the end of the year, I think we were in the high A um, playoffs, and, you know, the coaches batting me in the middle of the lineup, and I, I'm catching every game, and I feel really good. And I'm going back to that same level again, but obviously I know I'm going behind hedges, and, you know, I'm going to be the backup. But I, I know that I can play at the level and, and succeed, so I'm, I'm comfortable. Then I got lucky. He got hurt. I got to play and and then had a great year. Um, I definitely thought that was my breakout type year, even though, you know, fast forward, it wasn't a breakout at all. It was really just like a, hey, great job last year. We don't care type thing. But I mean, (laughs) um, but yeah, it, it definitely felt like that was something that put me out there, at least in my own mind. But obviously, that was not reciprocated <laughs> to the front office. But I mean, you know, it is what it is at that point. Yeah. Uh, where does the the All Star Game, uh, just in general, and where does the All Star Game home run? Where does that kind of rank in your your baseball memories? Um, probably top three, arguably the top. Um, my brother and my dad flew out for that game, which was really cool. I hadn't seen them in a while, and. Uh, you know, they, they both knew all of the frustrations and the um, kind of the, the uphill battles that had gone on through the years, you know, from from the injuries to college not starting off great to the struggles in pro ball with, you know, trying to get an opportunity and then, you know, for the homer to happen and then, you know, just, you know, the whole game. And it was a really cool experience. Had a great time with that. Definitely one of my all-time favorite memories arguably my favorite hit of my entire career so like you said things kind of didn't really progress maybe the way you you thought they would have after all that um just those next two years we don't need to to break it down too much but those next two years um two plus years really because you ended up getting released by the Padres in March of 2016 before you came to Somerset but but what yes what is that kind of time period like for are you are you sensing that things are are slipping away at that time I guess what is kind of your your mindset over those two plus years definitely sensing it knew it from the moment I did not get invited to big league camp uh, that 2014 year knew it 110 percent so the first few years you know you kind of see you get you get a feel for what goes on and every year I noticed that you have like six or seven catchers in big league camp yeah you got your three guys in the big leagues you got your triple a guys and your double a guys so the year before you know like you said high a all-star game double a go to double a end of the year we win the Texas League championship still hitting in the middle of the order. I'm like, ah, oh, you know, and, and you know, I know I struggled at the end, but it, when you look at the year as a whole, you're like, guy had a good year, you know? Um, so I'm like, oh, I'm obviously going back to double A next year. So wouldn't I be a shoe in 
for big league camp. Well, never gets, never get the call, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, why is this happening here? They ended up taking a guy who great player, but never was a catcher and tried to turn him into a catcher. That's uh, that spring training. And that's all the information I needed. I knew it as much as I didn't want to show it or tell it anybody. I knew the career with the Padres, unless something it completely drastic happened was done. Yeah. Um, it, it was just, you got to see the forest or the trees at that point. And, uh, definitely took a mental toll, but, uh, you had to know, I mean, it's it, the, the writings on the wall at that point. Yeah. I guess I'll, I'll edit out my own curse words. I've done this in the past in the pod and I'll do it again. Cause I don't know if there's another <laughs> way to ask it. Um, did you come into that 2014 season and then uh, going to San Antonio with kind of a, a shitty attitude or what, what was kind oh, of, yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Oh yeah. I was, I mean, you can edit it out again. I was fucking pissed. Yeah. Like, and not to mention the year started out, you know, I didn't play until the fifth game of the year by game 15. I had only played twice, you know, like eight at bats. Yeah. And I had guys on other teams that we played the year before that like, Hey man, why aren't you playing? I'm like, I don't know. You should go ask somebody. Cause I don't. And I'm like, you know, I, I eventually had to say to the hitting coach one day, I'm like, dude, like we have this, this is the same team I was on last year. And I hit third every game yeah. why am i not playing like what what the hell is going on yeah it, it, that's frustrating like to an extreme extent you know it gets in your head you start to question things you start to change things and i mean as i said before it can it snowballs out of control mentally and baseball being that big of a mental game it'll just eat you alive but yeah extreme frustration like I'm like, the, the, these guys are the same guys that I played with the year before, maybe a couple of different, but you don't just take the three hitter from the year before. And then all of a sudden he plays once every three, you know, once a week. It made no sense to me. I was so confused. Yeah. Uh, 15 season, you kind of bounce around pretty limited playing time. That is what it is. Uh, and and yep. the end of spring 16, they end up releasing you. Um, is <clears> that... Is that a weight off your shoulders? Is that is, is that still disappointing for you? I guess when when that moment happens, and I guess if you want to get into what that moment was like, feel free. But when when that moment does happen, um, what are the emotions like at that time? Yeah, it, it definitely it took a minute to sink in. I had a feeling it was going to happen just from looking at you know the way they, who they brought in over the winter and who was still around in spring training. I actually I was a little bit pissed that day. Um, because I called up one of the coordinators probably in January and I was seeing, you know, who they were bringing in catcher wise to big league camp and stuff. And, you know, you're going into your age, 27 year old year, I guess it would have been for me. Yeah. And you're seeing these guys that they're bringing to big league camp and you realize like, look, you're not going to big league camp. you got seven guys automatically ahead of you, not counting any prospects below you you know and you just add up the numbers and you realize there's not enough spots for everybody i called up the coordinator i'm like dude you know me i've been in the organization now for five years show me a little bit of respect i was like look man if you're planning on cutting me at the end of spring training just so i can come in and catch bullpens for you guys show me the respect now and get rid of me yeah please like just give me that and he's like no man i, I promise you we have something slotted for you, most likely double A, possibly extended type of thing. And I'm like, all right, fine. I got gotcha. you. Obviously, we both know that didn't happen. And I was actually cleaning up my stuff and I saw him on the way out and he looked at me. He put his head down and I'm like, you know what I'm going to say right now. <laughs> you know why I'm you know why I'm pissed. I talked to you two months ago and I told you this exact thing was going to happen. Yeah. You're going to bring me in, you're going to let me catch bullpens, and then you're going to cut me. I, that's exactly what I told you. And it, he's just like, I know, I know. And I'm like, well, then that's all we need to say. Take care. Yeah. You know, it's just like, uh, and the guy, and you know, I'm, I'm a one in a million, like, you know, plenty of other cases that, that know it. You know, when you've been around the organization long enough, you can see what's going to happen. You know, you just start adding it up. All you really ask for is like, look, man, be honest with me. Don't don't yank my chain like that. I know what you're about to do to me. Just, you know, be easy on me. And no, 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 that, that didn't happen. Yeah. Um, up for debate whether an organization would in, uh, intentionally screw someone by releasing someone at the end of spring. But it does screw a guy because more or less everybody's full. 
Um, when, yeah, when, when but got, you know, I don't think they intentionally try to hurt you. The bottom bottom line is you need guy, you need bodies in spring training. One, like I said, to catch the bullpens. Two, you don't know if anyone's going to get hurt. So the organization does have to have the insurance policy. They have to cover their ass. I get it, you know, completely. Doesn't you know? Doesn't take away the frustration, but it's a business, man. You, you got to understand. They got to be able to cover themselves. Yeah. So when that does happen, um, like I said, it's it's late. Everybody's full. Are you thinking, you know, I'm going to wait this out and see if somebody wants to bring me in, an organization wants to bring me in? Was Indie Ball always your first choice, playing closer to home? Um, what was kind of your, your thought process in eventually ending up in Somerset? Yeah, you know, honestly, it, it's kind of crazy. I got done packing my stuff up, drove back to my uh, the apartment that I was renting probably 20 minutes away, and John had, had texted me when I parked the car by that time. And I was like, I read it. John Hunton, Somerset Patriots, and I was like, holy crap, that couldn't even be a better situation. Like, that automatically was, like, number one on the list. Because I didn't obviously, I'm like, yeah, sure, if a guy from Affiliate Ball calls me, that's great, but it's, like, March 29th right now. The teams are already set, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I knew Affiliated was pretty much out of the, equ- the equation because that, that's why I asked the Padres to release me in the winter. Because by that time, you're, you're not going anywhere but extended, if that. But then I saw Summers at Patriots, and I'm like, 45 minutes from home. I know they have a great reputation, you know, great ballpark. You know, you're playing in the Atlantic League, which is the best indie league to play. And I'm like, that kind of couldn't be any more of a no-brainer. And that stayed, you know, the whole way through. I got probably another five or six calls from indie ball teams. But it was like, why? Why would I even? <laughs> there's, there's, no, there's no contest here. Yeah. Um, do you, this is something I don't think you and I have talked about, but do you go into that year thinking that it could be your last year? Absolutely. For sure. Yeah, I, I knew I wasn't playing the way I was playing back in like 2013. Um, but I also went into that year with a lot of hope that being home and being in a new change of scenery and just kind of being able to let loose a little bit of just like no more pressure of – you know, the Padres and all that frustration that was all built up, just go play baseball. I did have, you know, a, a really good outlook at the beginning of the year. Okay. But you always have it in the back of your mind, like, yeah, this could be it, if things don't pan out. So the Somerset experience, um, it seemed like, you know, for the most part, it seemed like you really enjoyed yourself there on the field, off the field. It seemed like you had a good time. You were a good fit in the clubhouse. Uh, everything was a good fit there. I guess, how would you kind of categorize your time and ultimately what was your, your last season in pro ball? Um, yeah, you know, the Patriots, they're a first class organization. They treat people the right way. Uh, we had a great staff that year. Um, Brett, Dommel, um, uh, gosh, well, he's going to, if he heard this, he'd kill me right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> He was my coach with the Padres too for a little bit. I can see his face and I uh, Barker and then uh, and those guys and stuff. Just awesome, awesome guys. Clubhouse was good. Um, I honestly, you know, it, they, it really is a first class organization from top to bottom. I had a blast being around there, seeing everybody. It is an interesting thing though in indie ball, and I I I, I got to imagine any of the other guys that you bring on will say this too. You get quite a mix of guys at different points in their career. And it can definitely create a very interesting clubhouse, no matter how good of people they are. Um, you, you get guys that, you know, have had their little bit of time in the big leagues to guys that have never played affiliated ball ever. And they are just trying to get into the whole thing. Yeah. Older guys, younger guys, the guys who've seen a little bit of, of, of everything in the middle, it creates a very interesting dynamic, a lot of, and obviously Indie ball is not where, you know, 80% of that room want to be. They want to be on that other side. So it can create a lot of frustrations and make things a little uneasy at times, but you really can't blame anybody. Everyone's there to try and get themselves better to get back to affiliated, get to the big leagues, you know, but it definitely creates an interesting dynamic. I know you must know it from, you know, covering it for so long and it's it's almost inevitable i feel like no matter no matter how successful that team is you can't go through that entire season with the constant changing of guys and have it be 
perfect the whole year of just camaraderie and attitude and vibe in the clubhouse because it's really not it's not possible in that type of situation with all those factors played in, you know? Yeah, I think for, for me, and I'm going to catch all kinds of hell for saying this, but when have I ever, <laughs> when have I ever cared about that? I think no. for me, for me in my experience, there's there's been some guys who, who maybe aren't realistic about where they're at in their careers when they're they're, sure. they're getting to indie ball. I guess, did you kind of, did you experience that as well? And I, I, we, don't, we don't, don't need names or anything like that, but did you kind of experience that as well in your time in Somerset? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you... At one point, every guy in that room, or 90% of the guys in that room, were playing at a level that probably could have played some games in the big leagues if they already had it, you know? Right. So, obviously, they're not playing at that level anymore, or they we all wouldn't be in that room. So, yeah, I mean, you do get some guys who just don't realize that, you know, look, man, you're not playing at that anymore. You, you gotta You gotta see that, you know? Yeah. But... You know, people don't always see it that way. You look at yourself through rose-colored glasses. I also envy those people a bit, too, because I think those people, if the ignorance is bliss, and, you know, in this case, it could actually benefit them from keeping a, a maybe a fake set of confidence, which is something that you need in, in life and maybe even in base, baseball especially. Yeah. So I, um, it's kind of a, an, an interesting dynamic that way. But no question, that can create a lot of interesting clubhouse vibes when you know yeah you get a guy who might have been on the top of the game you know seven years ago but you're obviously not man that's why we're sitting next to each other right now no offense to anybody that i played with but we were all in the same boat yeah you know we were all we were all really good at one point but obviously something wasn't going right anymore if we're all sitting in that room Yes. Um, speaking of things not going right, and my God, that's a crappy transition, but I got to do it to you. Um, that that last game, I, I, I oh, get, man. Ha- having gotten to know you, I, I hate it that that is your your last game and the way things went with yeah. behind the plate and, and the way things went in that series. Um, how much does that still eat at you? Does that bother you? Did that did that at all motivate you to want to consider coming back for another year? I guess having been kind of a couple years removed from that, what is kind of the, the thoughts uh, on all that? Yeah, you know, with it being the last game, you can't not think about it a good bit because that's the, the last thing that I ever did on a baseball field. Yeah. Um, and, you know, man, it, it, it sucked. And I, I had all the confidence in the world going into that game. Um, you know, I was catching I was catching Will, who me and him, I think I caught him the last, you know, like dozen times he pitched. We, he was throwing great. We were really vibing well. And, you know, when you're when you're playing sports, some days you're going to go in feeling perfectly good. And then something's going to happen very early on. And you just know that something's wrong like something is not right with the day the day today and i knew it like the first at bat it was it, 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 we got the first guy o2 he we did will had a great little like fading change up that we used to set on just righties would swing right over the top of it because we just drop right under their hands remember setting up guy hits a, a ground ball to shortstop but i knew it from the moment it happened my hand was too close, catcher's interference, and he's the first guy's on base off an 0-2 count. And it was just like, uh, it, it, you know, you just feel it in your gut, and you're like, something's wrong right now, you know? Like, yeah. today, the vibe just kind of, like, doesn't feel good right off, right off the bat, you know? And I was really hoping, like, I was waiting all game for the vibe to change, and it just didn't. And, uh, yeah, it sucked, man. It, it definitely felt like I, I, I was pissed after the game. I'm like, I'm going to come back. I'm going to do better. And I had that intention for a while until the off season. And, uh, you know, I had um, a couple offers to go play in the American Association. And uh, I kind of got integrated into the business. And I was like, you know what? I'm, I think this might be the time just to, to call it a quits because – yeah, but that that last game was that one sucked, man. Jeez, it was just I, I could I knew it from the beginning once that first thing happened, and then a couple other things, just uncharacteristic, uncharacteristic crap happened. And I was like, man, what a what a it, you know, you can't always always go out in a good way, but that one, yeah, it it sucks when you go out not playing a good game. I guess you could say. Yeah, I remember going up to you after that game, and that was not a fun experience for me. You were always great to me. There's no mistake about that. But going up to somebody after that kind of game, that sucks for someone in my shoes. And you were 
you were cool about it, but you were clearly still incredibly pissed off with how things went. And I'm kind of curious, um, what is the, the vibe in the clubhouse like after something like that? Are guys, is everybody cool with you? Is there, you know, stuff that, that comes from that? I mean, that's a pretty, you know, a tight unit of a team. I guess, what is, what is yeah. that like after that kind of experience? Well, I mean, no one's really... Um... I mean, you can, they can point fingers absolutely if they want. I know from, like I said, that first, you know, catcher's interference. And I think later on in that same inning, I had a, a ball in the dirt that should have been a hundred out of a hundred block that I missed. And I remember just being like, how, like, why, like, how do those two things just happen? You know, like really crazy, but no, no one, I mean, there, there might've been internal frustration by some of the guys in the clubhouse and I, I can't blame them. Everyone's a competitor in there, you know, but no one like showed it, you know, to me or anything like that. Um, yeah. I probably showed it about myself more, more than anything. Um, but, you know, I think everyone was just so pissed because I think we were up to nothing on that series. And we were always kind of battling with Long Island all year. And I remember when the series got tied 2-2, two to two, we all just kind of sat in the locker room before the game. We are like, you know what? Just We're so sick of these guys. Like, stop hanging around us. We know we're better. Let's just go take care of business. And everything was status quo until that first batter. And then it was just kind of like, you know – what and then you know boom snowball things just start happening and before you know it it's the seventh inning you're down three runs and you're like well crap like this really this really got out of hand quick yeah um i kind of did this as a bit of a joke in the intro but i did want to ask you about it as well um wearing number nine in somerset obviously you're familiar with kind of the, the history of that number in somerset with jeff nettles the, the patriots fan base is a smart fan base a very finicky <laughs> finicky fan base at times did anybody ever give you any crap for for wearing that number obviously it's not in your control but did that no happen? no one said anything and honestly i didn't know it was that guy who's all over the walls on under the stadium <laughs> until i picked it i picked it because it was my high school hockey number <laughs> okay yeah, I, I honestly, like, I when I came back home, I wanted to just kind of, like, get, you know, bring the good vibes of being home around me. So I was like, I'm going to be number nine, high school hockey, a lot of success, both in, um, individually and with the team, along with, you know, like, I always made my walkout songs, at least two out of the three of them, you know, somewhat about New Jersey or a song that was significant in some part of my baseball career, you know, away from the Padres. And, uh, yeah, I, I had no idea. And then all of a sudden you walk in and you're, like, reading all the championship stuff and mvps and like wow that guy's everywhere <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um why uh why nine in, in high school was that assigned to you did you pick it for someone you, you like talkie wise or actually dead serious i picked it because randolph had a guy when i started watching going to the games when i was in like seventh and eighth grade who was absolute stud um and he wore number nine and that's why i picked it i was never number nine in my entire life one of my close friends who um a few of us made varsity freshman year, got to pick our numbers, and he was always number nine in baseball. I was always number three. And then all of a sudden, I guess I picked first. And he's like, you picked nine? I'm like, he's like, why didn't you pick three like normal? I'm like, I, I, I don't know. I just had to do it. But I knew why I did it. It's because that guy before me who wore it before me, I was like, he was a stud. I was like, I want to be like that guy. Yeah, I have a buddy who plays hockey who wears 98 because he wanted to be as close to Gretzky as he can. So I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I understand. I probably that. will be as, as close as he gets. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, as close as anybody will ever get. Yes. Um, 100%. I remember, no doubt about it. I remember after, I think it was a year after you uh, you played in Somerset, you, you wrote a story for us about kind of your transition to, to life after baseball. And we talked about that at the beginning, kind of, um, you know, working for the paper company, all that stuff. But just in general, how has that kind of been just, um, you know, being away from the sport for, a couple of years um yeah you, de you definitely think about it a lot you know you, you know on a on a couple long drives from you know customer to customer or something you definitely you miss uh you know just competing and uh having that focus every game and being able to physically compete as opposed to you know now just kind of trying to you know compete with you know working hard and trying to sell and grow the business you just it was a whole different thing and it was a lot of fun uh, now you just find it in other ways, I guess, like old man softball or on the golf course. <laughs> um, but no, you, you, you can't not miss it. I mean, it was a, a experience of a lifetime and uh, just the experiences, the, 
the, the, the friendships made, the, the things that you got to learn about life and yourself and just the ultimate fun of being able to compete for it as a job and, and play baseball. It was, you know, you, you take it for un, undoubtedly, you take it for granted while you're doing it, but, um, it's cool to look back on. It sucks that you can't time travel and do it over again, but such is life. And, uh, it's just a cool memory, you know? Yeah, things are are going great with the business, as you mentioned, but would you ever consider getting back in the game, whether it be lessons, coaching, anything in in that kind of nature? For sure, absolutely. Lessons, not so much. I did that for a while. I think I'm safe to say that I'm off of that for a bit, (laughs) but I think it it would be really cool. Um, And actually, I, I have been doing coaching, but not with baseball. I've actually been coaching at Randolph High School Hockey. Okay, Um, I I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. I um, when I got done, the coach who he's been there forever. He was my coach when I was in high school, and now my buddy, actually, oddly enough, who I the guy who I just said was like, "Why'd you pick number nine? Who I played with my whole life?" He's now the assistant coach at Randolph. Um, and he called me up, and they had a, a spot open to help out um the jv team and small world obviously the jv coach is a, a guy a couple years older than me that i played with a few years on on varsity and i've stayed friends with till this day and i was like yeah i'd love to you know it's, it's a, like a, it's considered a volunteer position i go i have do practices at games um get to go on the bench when they always make the finals every single year and, and that is uh, a powerhouse too for people who are listening to this who do not know that is a powerhouse new jersey high school yeah. program it's serious. I think um, they had the the, the uh, when you first walked into Prudential this year, they give out you know the pamphlets and everything, yeah. and they kind of just show like you know the teams, the roster, the records, and then they show state championship appearances and record over the past like fifteen years. And Randolph was like had like twelve or thirteen appearances in the last fifteen years in the state finals. Not even just, you know, semis, whatever. They are always there. It is it's ridiculous. Jeez. Um so it was cool with being in the game that they won this year. We all it was a you know, even not even really knowing many of the guys on the varsity team except for the ones that have moved up from J V over the years past. Um I don't know if I t- even I know we talked a little bit. I think I uh I think I Snapchatted you something about uh, us winning, and yeah, you, you were you, at you, Prud- te- you were at Prudential the next night. Yeah, you texted me a photo or something. I guess of the, the the celebration photo or something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We we were up two nothing, complete control of the game. Gave up two goals in the third period within twenty seconds of each other, with like two and a half minutes left. Ugh. It was the I've, I've i i my my stomach dropped mike i'm telling you it was like i cannot believe this just happened it was it was a wild game but it was cool yeah well it's it's glad i'm glad to see that you found uh you know something to keep you occupied both uh in sports and kind of in business as well drop the website again too for uh, alan paper supply man uh, www.allenpapersupply.com. If that doesn't work, just Google Allen Paper Supply, and maybe I missed a part of it. But uh, we usually pop up as the first thing when you put that in. Um, nothing really crazy on it. Gives a good overview of the company and uh, tells you what we're all about. And yeah, if we can help anybody out, we'd be more than happy to. Awesome. Well, make sure you check out uh, Rob and Allen Paper Supply and. Uh... It's been a pleasure catching up with you, man. It's been uh, same to you. Yeah, it's been fun, uh, kind of becoming closer over the, the past couple of years. Like I said, you were at my wedding. You've become a pretty close friend. Uh, looking forward to seeing you again, going to Stex maybe uh, when we finally can uh, get uh, within six feet of each other again. So uh, thank you again. You for read my time. mind. Yes, you read my mind. I was gonna say when this is all done, we're going to grab some sandwiches at Stex, playing some NHL, and we'll catch up. Hopefully, I would love to catch a hockey game if this if this thing will ever end. Um, that'd be freaking awesome too. Yeah, as long as uh, they're letting people in, heck yeah, man. So that'll probably be a little while, but we'll we'll all find out together, I guess. So hundred percent, hundred percent. Thank you for having me on, Mike. I had a blast talking. All right, thank you, Rob. All right, guys, thank you so much for checking out that chat with Rob Crow. Rob's become a very good friend of mine over the past couple of years. He's been in this very apartment, one that we are actually moving out of soon. Breaking news. Uh, he's been over this very apartment to play uh, some NHL, as he mentioned as well. Nice of him to mention that I won. Some guys are, are not wanting to admit that, that, uh, that I win a lot. So anyway, uh, that was our episode uh, with Rob Crow, episode number nine. Episode number 10, I'm not sure who we're going to have yet. I do have a couple people lined up. I'm just not sure what order we're going to do them in yet. Uh, I will have that for you soon. 
I'm glad you guys enjoyed this one. Make sure you check out the first eight as well. And I will see you guys soon. Stay safe. Stay inside. And wash your damn hands, people. I'm Mike Ashmore for the Untitled Mike Ashmore Podcast. Y'all have a good day, okay?